just to kind of sum up some of what we've looked at, this quite large review of over 200 studies on birth order finds only children more likely to do better intellectually. Okay, again, grades, education attainment, more of a need for achievement, more likely to go to college, but also more likely to be rated as, you know, selfish. Remember, only children, you know, more used to having things their way, but also more perfectionistic in that, you know, they can leave their toys and so on when they're children the way they want. No one's going to come and disrupt them, okay? They'll come back and things are still the way that they left them, okay? So they're kind of more used to this kind of order and the way that they want things to be. The, the, the highest number of effects come from firstborn children, okay? More likely to do better academically, intellectually, high achievers. There's a number of other research that shows that firstborns are disproportionately overrepresented amongst leadership positions, including presidents of the US, generals in the army, a whole bunch of other high ranking positions in um, our, uh, the army and the Navy and other uh, US forces. Um, more likely to be tenured professors, more likely to be CEOs. Okay, so any kind of, you know, real high position within a particular area, more likely to have an overrepresentation of firstborns, more likely to be highly motivated, a leader dominant, overrepresented amongst learned persons. Yeah. You said I'm likely to have frightening dreams. Do you know anything about why that is? Um, probably links to feeling higher pressure, having higher ambitions. Maybe that's part of it. Um. But yeah, also more likely to be influenced by authority, high self-esteem, type A behavior, always on the go, dependent on others for approval, more vulnerable to stress. So that's also probably linking into the stressful dreams. Um, but they present themselves as being least emotional, uh, more self-disciplined, um, and mature behavior. So, you know, firstborns more likely to be given responsibilities at an early age, more likely to be told. You know, make sure your younger brother does this. Okay, make sure you watch over your younger sister, whatever. So from quite an early age, they have, you know, they're quite used to a uh, sense of authority and um, status over others, if you like. But again, you know, I would say that the birth order effects are more, you know, predisposing factors, okay, that make it more likely one will be more suited for this or feel more used, uh, more used to being within this sort of scenario. But it's not really determining anything, especially you know, if it is making it more likely one feels comfortable in, a, in an authority position, for example, you know, it's not really determining what kind of authority figure they are, right? If they're, you know, more tyrannical and if they're quite bossy or if they're more kind of like, a, you know, a guide and kind of like a kind of nurturing teacher kind of figure, you know, this is going to be, you know, mediated, moderated by a whole bunch of other factors like the relationships between the siblings, the parenting styles and so on. Um, second borns may be more likely to be rebellious, um, non-conforming, right? You know, if the firstborn wants order, because if it's in order, then, you know, they're always the ones in charge, whereas the second borns want to disrupt that order, okay, so that they're also getting attention and responsibilities and so on. Um, Overrepresented amongst athletes, competes in different areas than the oldest, but Again, remember the teeter-totter effect, right? If the children are close together in age, more likely they'll compete in the same field. Otherwise, more likely the second born will go into a different field, right? If the first born's excelled academically, then the second born might put their attention into, you know, athletics or music, art, something mechanical, something different than what the first born's chosen to pursue. Um, middle children, feelings of not belonging, sociable success in team sports, kind of like what we were saying. Um, so maybe more likely to considering the feelings of others, um, but also kind of feeling overlooked, um, you know, more privileges granted to the older born, more attention given to the younger born. Um, some, again, research suggests middle children more overrepresented amongst certain positions to do with um, the caring for the welfare of others, members of the Peace Corp, um, jobs to do with um, diplomacy, okay. 
So that would also be kind of congruent with this. Youngest borns more likely to be in detainers. Okay. So it might be the case that, you know, they have to feel as though they have to work extra hard to get the parents impressed, right? The parents are, you know, been there, done that. They've already seen, you know, the children go through these various stages. And so in order to really impress the, the parents, they have to work a bit extra harder. Interestingly, they're more likely to have pet names in English speaking countries, Spanish speaking countries, and the Japan. So, you know, Johnny instead of James or Sammy instead of Sam, you know, something such as that. Okay. Could be true in other countries as well, but these are just the ones that have been um, researched in. Um, so, again, that's kind of tying in with the idea that maybe they might be in a situation where older children do things for them and they're kind of, you know, babied, if you like, by some of the older. Um, siblings um, and this might make it difficult for them to deal with stresses later in life so more likely to um, get a divorce um, act out if, the, if there's a seven year difference usually higher self-esteem but anxiety if the gap is larger more likely to be perceived as spoiled Um, but again, they're predisposing factors, right? It's not really determining anything. They're small effects. And also it's going to be moderated by a number of other factors within the household, right? You know, if the youngest born does feel extra pressure to be entertaining in order to get attention, right? There's numerous ways in which they could do that, right? They could be pretty um, sarcastic in their humor, trying to, you know, rile other siblings up, or they could be um funny and entertaining and, and different in a different way right okay um any questions about what i've said on birth order either tuesday or today before i move on yeah uh, so when you're talking about like the first versus second forms um like the second forms could apply to like the middle child or the youngest child depending on how many there are yeah so Remember, there could be overlap between these categories, right? If you're the second born and the middle born, I would expect probably some characteristics of both. So there might be some competitiveness with the first born. Um, there might be going into a different field if there's a large age gap. But also, you probably will be used to compromises and caring for others. So there'll probably be characteristics on both types. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah good question. Anything else? Okay, um, I'll talk a little bit about Adler's psychotherapy techniques, okay, because, you know, like Jung and Freud, he's using these feelings of personality in order to help his patients through psychotherapy. Um, Adler actually has quite a number of ways of getting insight into personality. Birth order was a big one he was a fan of. He would... Um, try and work out in the first session what the birth order position was of his patients and and he would do that also at, at dinner parties and when giving a lecture and so on he would quite often try and you know guess people's birth order position after asking them a few questions thinking that i could maybe you know win them over to how insightful psychology can be at times um but also he thought the way that you walked the way that you slept and so on also gave some sort of insight into your personality you know, do you have good posture, which means you're more confident or you're more kind of, you know, slunched over, which might mean you're more insecure. Um, <clears throat> similar when you're sleeping, if you were, if you sleep flat, flat on your back, he thought that was a more confident person, whereas if you're more kind of huddled over onto the side, he thought that meant more insecure. Um, but one particular method he had was asking for one's earliest memory, so early recollections believing that this would give some insights into the final goal that they have and their lifestyle, okay? So for Adler, when you, when you think about your first memory, it very, it very well might be the case it isn't an accurate memory, okay? But it's not important whether it's a true memory or whether it's a fabrication. Either way, you're thinking about it because it's giving some sort of insights into your current troubles, okay, your current goals okay who you currently are um I'll, I'll give you some other examples but just off the bat um 
in one of his case studies, his patient is asked, um, what's your earliest memory? She talks about um, horse riding as a little girl with her sister. Um, and then her sister kind of eggs her on to chase after her. And so they get into a race and then she falls off the horse and she injured herself. Um, and Adler believed that there was still some tension even all these years later between the sisters, okay, that there was still some competitiveness and that this was still a kind of source of why she was feeling stressed within the family and so on. Um, and that kind of turned out to be true. Um, in other studies, he found that doctors, for example, had first memories that were often to do with illness or death, okay, which he thought was what was motivating them to be doing the job that they were doing, wanting to help people, save people from death and so on. So again, your earliest memory might give some sort of insight into what it is that you want out of your life. Um, I should maybe say, you know, during his psychotherapy, it was very different than Freud's approach. For him, it's two people sitting in an armchair, you know, the therapist and the patient, and they're getting to know each other. It's a bit more kind of friendly and a bit more relaxed, okay? Whereas remember for Freud, you know, the patient's lying down on the couch, Freud's sitting behind them, he's an authority figure, he's the interpreter. For Adler, it wasn't really like this, it's more about working through problems together, okay, and the therapist is more kind of like prompting them, and rather than interpreting things necessarily for them. Um, he also believed in dream analysis, but again, he disagrees with Freud on a, on a, in a number of ways. He doesn't think that, you know, these are wish fulfillments, for, for Adler, he believes that these are to do with current worries, current anxieties, things you're worried about right now. Um, again, he thought it was quite unique in terms of what the dream might mean from person to person. So he doesn't have a interpretation sheet in the way that Freud did, okay, in which there's universal symbols that mean this for people universally. But he still found some commonalities, okay, across cases, like um, a dream about a tooth falling out. He often found was reflective of a worry over a big change in one's life. But again, it's to do with current anxieties, current worries. It's not about traumas in the past, okay, fixations and the way that for Freud, um, dreams might give some sort of insight into it. Um, for Adler, you know, if it's, um, you know, a sexual dream, it might be sexual anxiety. If it's a job to do with your, a, a dream to do with your job, it might be some workplace anxiety, right? It's giving insight into something that's worrying you right now. Um, this is just a description of his idea over um, early recollections. So the reminder you carry with you is not by chance. Um, out of the number of impressions a person receives, they've chosen to consider this one. Um, so it has to bear some sort of um, insight into their current problems. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's actually the first memory or even a memory at all. Um, it's more important in terms of what it represents, okay? Their interpretation of life, their bearing on the present and future. So I'll give you a couple of examples that he that he kind of talks about in his writing um, and then his analysis of it. So this is one person's earliest recollection. When I was four years old, I couldn't draw well. Often I wanted to draw a man. My mother would say, you make the nose look like a cucumber. I did not let this disturb me and I went on drawing. When it was all finished, I showed it to my mother. She said, no, you don't make the nose look like a cucumber. From that time on, I was able to draw pretty men. I always remember that. Okay, so, you know, imagine, you know, you're in Adler's situation. The person's just said that this is their first memory. What kind of insight do you think that may give you into the person? What do you think that might tell you about them? Yeah. Oh, you think so? Okay, but but how did this? How did the? How did it work out? Right. Okay. 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 Yeah. Right. So it's kind of the opposite. Then more you think this tells you that they're more persistent, right? So that they can work through problems. Yeah. 
Sorry, one more time. Looking for approval, okay, because they felt kind of dependent on their mother's approval. Okay, fair. Yeah. Okay. Well, different interpretations, but for Adler, this was a well-adjusted person. Okay. Um, they struggled, but then they won. Okay. So they grew into an adult who was successfully able to uh, face life's challenges, um, work through problems until those problems are solved. Um, okay. Um, so for him, that was an example of a kind of healthy early recollection. Um, here's another one. Earliest memory, a coffee pot falling off the table and scolding me. Pretty brief, but if, what, if, what do you think that might tell you about this person if that's their earliest memory? They might be a little fearful of coffee. Okay, fearful of coffee. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. The world's against them. Okay, maybe the world's against them, right? So, okay, yeah. Um, um, yeah, that is actually kind of what Adler interpreted. Okay, so such is life. We ought not to be surprised to find that the woman whose autobiography began this way was pursued by a feeling of helplessness, and she overstated the dangers and the difficulties of life. Neither should we be surprised um, that she reproached other people for not taking sufficient care of her. Okay, so it did reflect more of a kind of victim mentality. So, you know, this is Adler's ideas, this is some of his case examples, some of his analysis, but, you know, does it actually hold any weight to it? You know, is it actually a useful method? Does it actually give any insight? Um, well, some research suggests that it might. People diagnosed with anxiety are more likely to have early memories that are to do with some sort of fear. Those diagnosed with depression often do have early memories centering around abandonment. Um, alcoholics in one study, early memories often to do with some sort of threat from external circumstances that they themselves couldn't control or protect themselves from. Um, a number of studies, both in the US and Israel, have been able to predict people's careers based upon what their early memories were, kind of similar to the doctor study that Adler did, finding that doctors had early memories to do with illness or death. Um, criminals memories that often involved aggressive interactions. Um, and indeed, when these early memories have been fact-checked, okay, by asking parents and siblings and so on to confirm whether they're true, quite often they're not, okay? Which, you know, for Adler didn't matter. It didn't matter if they were true or false. And actually the fact that they're not true in many cases is probably in support of his theory that you know these are being developed post hoc, right? To give for some other reason other than the fact that they're actually one's earliest memory. Um, in one, I think, really interesting study, I'm surprised that hasn't been replicated, but you know, there isn't many therapists now that focus just on Adler's ideas. But in this study, they've looked at early memories at the beginning of psychotherapy and then early memories again after psychotherapy. Um, and what they found was that one's earliest memory actually changed quite profoundly, quite by 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 quite dramatic, quite dramatically, over the course of therapy. Okay, so that would be again congruent with Adler's ideas because you know if this early memory is given some insights into some some neurotic feelings or some neurotic behaviors, some neurotic thoughts, um then hopefully we would expect through therapy that these will be addressed, that these will be changing and that one will develop a healthier lifestyle and so on. And so we would expect then to hopefully have a healthier first early recollection. <clears throat> um, some of his other ideas also have some support. Um, those who score higher in inferiority, less likely to be successful. Um, in 700 plus patients hospitalized for depression, they did have parents who were more detached, hostile, rejecting. Um, remember for Adler, neglect, right, is something that can put one on an unhealthy trajectory, right? Um, through kind of abnormal development. Um, and indeed, you know, those who score higher in depression more likely to have been neglected. Um, and as well as neglect, he also put importance on spoiling, right? He said, if you over pamper, over protect the child, 
then this might also set them up to fail later in life. Um, and indeed, spoiled children, one study, more likely to grow up to be narcissistic. And, you know, being narcissistic has some overlap with his idea of a superiority complex, which, you know, again, is stemming from inferiority at, at its core insecurity. Um, and then some researchers have developed surveys to measure his idea on social interest, you know, care for others and so on. Um, those who score high in this, more likely to be empathetic, popular, less likely to be stressed, depressed, anxious, hostile. Criminal offenders, less likely to be high in social interest. Um, and it also seems to have a number of physical health benefits as well if you're high in social interest. <clears throat> So how might we evaluate Adler's theory? Well, he's again putting importance on future goals and ambitions rather than just looking at people as past orientated. Um, he's had quite a lot of impact, even if he hasn't always received the credit for it, right? The inferiority complex is something that's kind of well discussed. Um, birth order research, something that's had quite a bit of a uh, impact since. Um, the idea of compensation, again, something that's pretty well accepted that people compensate for their insecurities. Um, he gives equality to the sexes, focuses on you know the whole person and social factors that influence personality. Um, and overall, it was a pretty positive outlook, right? He argues that people are conscious, that they have free will, that they're able to change their personalities. So it's much different than Freud's outlook on things. And indeed, some empirical support, you know, that I've just given examples of. But it's a pretty simple theory, right? Some would say it's in some ways a common sense theory in some ways. Um, and some of the concepts are not particularly well defined or operationalized or really given much elaboration on. Um, there is some gaps in the theory. Again, you know, a lot of this is put together by those who have looked over his lectures and then um, translated them because he didn't write a lot himself. Um, he hasn't received much public recognition. And again, his ideas, you know, don't lend themselves to scientific testing very easily. So he's putting importance on nature and nurture. He believes people have free will. Um, and that people can change their personalities. So here's your key learning outcomes. Um, there's also now the study guide on Canvas, which goes over the key outcomes from the lectures in a bit more detail. 